mention anxiety. So I want to talk to you about anxiety a little bit. I know anxiety is uh, a big content you covered in your new book, Feeling Great also. Um, and anxiety is so common in both Silicon Valley where we both are and like cross the world, a lot of people, if they are high achievers, they really motivated or they work really hard. There are a lot of worries in our mind. And sometimes it's so much, so overwhelming and so difficult to control it. Yeah. In fact, on my Feeling Good podcast, which if listeners are interested in, they're free of charge and you can find them on my website, feelinggood.com. But we just did two double podcasts, two consecutive podcasts on the achievement addiction uh, from, from two different perspectives. So there's, there's four, uh, podcasts on anxiety associated with, I, I, I'm not good enough. And as you say, it's extremely, uh, common in, in Silicon Valley. In fact, the subtitle of one of the podcasts is, you know, Siliconitis. <laughs> they, like we have all these achieving people and and it's it's knitted into the core of western civilization uh my worth equals my achievement and now i think in the asian countries the the same thing is happening there where you're thinking my worth as a human being depends on my my achievements it's the calvinist work work ethic uh and uh uh, the uh, accepting your averageness, accepting your below averageness, instead of with with shame, but but with joy. It's the it's the uh, Buddha talked about the great death of the self. That in in the type of therapy I do, calling team therapy, it's kind of like cognitive therapy on steroids. There's actually four great deaths of the self. One has to do with recovery from depression and a fourth grade death has to do with overcoming habits and, and addictions. But the great death in anxiety is, as you know so well, uh, confronting the thing that you're afraid of, you're co confronting your, your fears. And while exposure is not a treatment for anxiety and never will be, it mm. has to be a component of the treatment of anxiety for, for everybody. There's other things in addition to exposure that can have mind-blowing effects in eliminating anxiety but you have to you have to have that that exposure and i know because when i wrote my book on anxiety when panic attacks while i was reading it i i thought oh my gosh david you've had 11 anxiety disorders yourself <laughs> and then after it was published i thought of six more that i had forgotten about and and I've had the fear since I've been little. I had the fear of bees and blood and heights and and dogs and horses and public speaking and you name it. And I've had it. And I think that's why I just love treating anxiety disorders because whatever you have, I can say, oh, I've had that too. And I know how sucky that is. But I can also show you the way out of the woods. I can show you how to overcome that completely and quickly. And what a joy that's going to be. So I just absolutely love treating anyone who's, who's anxious. Uh, you know, I, I used to have public speaking anxiety that was crippling. My first talk, I, I, I was at, at Oxford University in England. I was supposed to present to this NATO Advanced Study Institute on metabolic compartmentation in the brain. And I was, they invited the world's top 80 brain scientists, like from NIMH, and then they had a few junior people there. And I was one of the junior people because I was just doing research as a psychiatric resident. But I knew that my research I was challenging research that came out of the National Institute of Mental Health because I, I realized that this thing that they'd done on brain serotonin metabolism really wasn't correct. Mm. And so I was presenting there, I was invited to present th this research, which was really cool. But I knew that the man whose research I was attacking was going to be at that conference. 
And I also heard that he loved to shout at people and humiliate people uh, in, in public uh, Oops. <laughs> uh, conferences. And the whole night before I was the last talk person to talk at the conference, I had five days of just intense anxiety hearing all these brilliant people who were so beyond where I could ever hope to be. And I was just t terrified. And the night before, I couldn't sleep one minute. You talk about insomnia. And I uh. just wandered around Oxford University and it seemed like the owls were ho hooting at me, <laughs> scorning me. And I had fantasy that he would sit right in front of me, uh, right in front of the podium. And that I'd get so nervous, I would just mumble my talk. And then he would stand up and start shouting at me. Oh. That was my fantasy, and it was just horrible. So the, finally, the time came, and I, I was so exhausted because I hadn't had any sleep. And I walked up to the podium, and there he was, just like in my fantasy, sitting right oh. in front of the podium. Because I guess he'd read, you know, what the presentation was going to be. And I got so nervous, I just kind of read and mumbled my talk. It was just ten-minute talk. And then uh, the moderator said, does anyone have any uh, questions for the young doctor? And then this guy, I'll, I'll say his first name, I won't say his last name, but it's Erminio. He was this mad Italian, brilliant guy. He was a head of the pre-clinical psychopharmacology laboratory at NIMH. And he started shouting at me and telling me that my research was BS and, and I didn't know what I was talking about. And, and it was exactly as I had fantasized. Wow, nightmare came true. Oh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then, and then he, he sat down and there was silence in the room. And then the moderator said, does anyone else have any questions for the young doctor? And it was just stony silence. And then he said, well, this ends our conference and now we're all gonna walk to this restaurant, you know, two weeks, two blocks from here and we'll have our final, you know, uh, celebratory dinner or whatever. And I remember walking there, no one would walk next to me. And I, and I sat down at a table, no one would sit next to me. And it was just unbelievably uh, humiliating. Uh, so that, that would be my public speaking anxiety. And on the plane going home, it was just, just terrible uh, f for me. And then I got to thinking what he, what he said. And it struck me that he was still full of, totally full of bullshit. And that he was saying, what he was saying made no sense at all. And I went back and I talked to my collaborators and I said, this is wh wh what he said. And I had a fellow on my team named Martin Pring who, who uh, was reputedly the second top mathematician in the United States. And I said, I, I, I still think their math is screwed up. And he says, you're absolutely right. So we ran some more simulations just to prove that what he had said at Oxford couldn't possibly be valid. And then I, I, I wrote it up uh, and submitted it to a journal. It was the first article that I had ever, ever written. And the editor called me three weeks later and I said, oh God, why don't they just send a rejection letter? You know, uh, what do have to, more, this is more humiliation. And he, and he said, I want you to know that your article uh, it was kind of unusual. It, it was accepted and there was no suggestions to modify it. And so we're going to be publishing it in the, the next issue of our journal. But it, we're wondering if we could submit it for the A.E. Bennett Award, which is f for the top award for an investigator less than 35 years of old, years of old doing basic brain research. And you'll be competing with Erminio and his laboratory and people from all over the world. Mm. And this is such a long story. I shouldn't have gotten into this, but anyway, we're almost very done. inspiring. Yeah, I think. that's yeah. very good. Yeah, mm -hmm. and and so so I said yes, yeah, so, so, submit it. That I have no had no idea that that would be right. And then he called two weeks later. He says you're the unanimous winner of this year's A. E. Bennett Award, and can you talk, present your findings to a thousand scientists 
ne next month at, at this the, the, our annual meeting. And I said, you, you bet I, I will. And then every night before I went to bed, instead of fantasizing humiliation, I, I fantasized that I would just talk and just talk from the heart, mm. not without notes, and just tell them what a great team that I had and what an honor it was and how excited I was and how important, you know, th this, this type of research could be because we were using computer simulation techniques on, on brain metabolism. And, uh, and, and I didn't believe it. I thought I'll probably screw up. I said, no, fantasize it in this beautiful way. And, and I'm going to talk how fantastic my colleagues were, uh, Martin Pring and Jack London and David Brunswick, uh, because there were four of us uh, on, on, the, on the paper. And then I went to New York and I got up to the podium and I fantasized that they'd all rush to the podium <clears throat> at the end of my, my talk. And I gave my talk and I was very excited when I gave it and, and mm. just full of enthusiasm. And then at the end, dozens of people came rushing up to the podium and everyone was, oh, that was so wonderful, and your research is, is so great. So that was, that was like the end of one of my, my anxiety disorders, but I've certainly, certainly had a lot of them. <clears throat> but I, 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 I just, I, 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 I see that anxiety can almost always be treated really quickly without drugs, and, uh, and a lot of people don't know that. They, they go to the doctor and the doctor says, you need this antidepressant or you need this benzodiazepine. And then they get addicted to like Valium and Librium and Xanax and things like that. But I, I think that uh, it's great that we've got now, you know, I, I use over a hundred techniques in treating depression and anxiety. And I, I just love working with people because I like seeing people go from despair to joy or even to to euphoria and uh, and and it's just sad because people get hopeless they don't even know this is possible right it's so important for people to know there are hope there yeah there are resources there are great treatment for anxiety out there and I love your story. I could not imagine how hard it was for you to, to face a certain figure, a established figure in the field and challenge him right there. And when, when your worries came true, you still hold on it and keep on working through it. Yeah. That's some resilience right there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was one of the worst moments of my life, I'll tell you. But uh, yeah, that yeah, that's there's a price to pay for recovery, and one of the prices is is to confront your your fears. And mm -hmm. usually, when people confront their fears, they they get over it much faster than I did. It's the the, the, the uh, but yeah, that as you know, exposure is is so so important. And uh, uh, but anyway, mm -hmm. yeah. So um, some very simple more simple question about our average general audience, just in case they know limited about their anxiety, which is very common. A lot of people have very limited awareness of yeah. what's happening inside of us, right? Yeah. So how would they know they, to help themselves recognize, oh, I'm actually anxious, or maybe my anxiety level is a little bit higher than I could manage? Well, well one thing they do, I have a five item anxiety test on my website, feelinggood.com, and it has a reliability of over uh, 90%. It's ex extremely accurate. And uh, anyone can take it for free. If you go to feelinggood.com, you can just take the anxiety test and then you'll get an immediate, you'll get an email with uh, showing exactly what your score means and how anxious you are. And then if right. you want, you, you'll also uh, can uh, si sign up to get a free anxiety class. So every, I think the way it works is every other day, you'll get one of about oh, 20 or, or more lessons in anxiety, both the basic techniques uh, of, of treating all anxiety. And then there's, there's specialized uh, 
sessions on the various kinds of anxiety, social anxiety, obsessive compulsive di di disorder, and so forth, and, and, and actual uh, live treatment of, of people as well. So you can see someone actually recovering before your very eyes or ears, I guess, because most of them are on, on audio. So that's something that people can do like today, if you want, it's, it's, it's right there available at, at, at feelinggood.com. And then ho hopefully the new book, Feeling Great, will provide extra vitamins for people too to, uh, to deal with all kinds of negative uh, feelings, not just anxiety, but depression as well. Yeah, definitely. So people, if they are concerned about that, they can go to your website, take this test. And if it came out like it's higher or to a certain level, they can consider seeking help. Yeah, a a absolutely. And there's one for depression too. Mm. There, there's a free uh, depression test and a free depression class on my website. There's also two free unpublished chapters for my new book. I had so much wow. material, I had to take out 10 of the chapters and two of them that were really strong are on habits and addictions. And, and, and but so they, but I told the publisher, you know, don't put all, it's too much stuff in the book. So, but you can get those two chapters on habits and addictions, they're free. You just click on that thing on the website for the, it says for a free chapter, but you actually get two free chapters on how to overcome habits and addictions like uh, overeating or uh, substance abuse or, shopping or drinking too much or whatever whatever the the issue is yeah that's that's great great resources i'm so appreciate that you are offering all these free resources to people who are you need uh, who are in need well the, the the thing is that most people don't have that much by way of resources even the therapists who come to my tuesday training group at stanford it's free for a therapist in northern california any any mental health professional or graduate student can come and attend the group for as long as you want. You get un, unlimited free psychotherapy training and unlimited free uh, psychotherapy too, because we we treat the people who come to the group if if they if they want it as a part of their their training. But I'm just aware. I mean, I was a minister's son growing up, and and so we never had m much money, and and I know that. Most people these days don't have much money. Even most mental health professionals are pretty poor. Mm. Uh, they, they're right. they're just they're they're struggling, and I, I've always thought, well, the be the best things in life are free. So I I treat people for free, and I train people for free, and I have all this free stuff on my website. They may say, "Burn sucks," but you can't beat the price. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> You helped so much, so many people. Wow, amazing! Really, like our our model, like as younger, um, like clinicians in this field, definitely look up to you. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm just so honored to meet you and to be on your show. Yeah, thank you. Oh, uh, if you still have time, I have one last question just sure. to run back to the original stigma question because often I think in our life, a lot of people, you know, when we, um, when our feelings really impact our lives, impact our functions, we hear people around us say, that's nothing. Why you are bothered by this? Why you are still like, you know, putting yourself in there, struggling with it, just snap out of it, Yeah. right? Uh, we hear that so much. I think that's very invalidating. Yeah. 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 Not, on, not only is that invalidating, but people also say really lame things to people who are depressed and anxious, like, uh, oh, you're a good person, or you're a survivor, or think about this or that positive quality. And, and that always irritates people. It never helps. And uh, a lot of people just don't know how to empathize. And to, to me, there's, there's three things uh, about empathy. And, and even uh, most mental health professionals, to be honest, are not uh, skillful at empathy. They think they are, but if you put it to the test, they're, they're not. But, it, but it's, it's like repeating the other person's words, acknowledging their feelings and doing that in an atmosphere of, of warmth and caring without trying to help a person or, or to cheer them up. So just, and, and, and that, that's so hard for people to learn. But, 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 but for example, 
when when my my daughter never wanted to have a, have children. She never wanted to get married. And then she met a really good guy, and they lived together for you know ten years or more. And then one day she said, "We're going to get married, and and I want to have a baby." And that was like fantastic. But after the baby was born, she would say things to me like, dad, I, I'm in prison now for, for uh, 18 years until he's 18 and I can't go to Aikido anymore and I can't do this and I feel like I'm in prison. And all I did was empathize. I did not try to help her in any way. And I would just say things like, you're right, senior, you are in prison in a way and it's sad and uh, you know your little guy is a, a beautiful little guy and it's it's wonderful how how you love him and and we love him and you're just probably the best mother in the world but uh but the fact is uh, you're you're paying a very heavy price and it's unfair or all the pressures on mothers and everything you're saying is valid. I just totally agree with you. And then she would say, well, actually, dad, I'm feeling better now, <laughs> you know, and it was just wow. empathy. Do you see not trying to change, change anything, but that's very hard for people, be, uh, therapists as well, because you, you, you love a friend or a loved one and you, you des and you, you may be frustrated that they're depressed all the time and you try to cheer them up and it just, makes makes matters worse and but sometimes doing nothing it's a bo another buddhist idea is to give people nothing and that's what they need and want and it's i call empathy the zero technique you offer the person zero and said you zero in on what they're thinking and feeling and you do that in a spirit of acceptance and warmth and caring but you don't try to change anything and, and that's, that's what people need to learn how, how to do. One of our most popular of all of the podcasts, we're over 200 now on my Feeling Good podcast, but, which is how to help and how not to help. And that, that's a good one for people to, to listen to. Not only does it really show you how to help people by listening, but there's also an audio clip, an actual audio clip of a woman trying to cheer up someone who was depressed mm -hmm. and and you can hear how off-putting and annoying it, it it is she she let us you know i just happened to have a recording of when she was when she was doing this but it, it's it's far easier than people think to help someone who's who's depressed and anxious but you have to give up the idea that you're going to help them in order to help them Right. Love that. So family members, friends do yeah. have a lot to learn how to support someone. Yeah. And for people who are anxious or depressed themselves, there are resources out there they can find to help themselves. Right. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Burns, for coming to the show today. Uh, this, this is wonderful. I so love everything you shared with the audience. Thank you so much. It's just been a very special moment for me too. You know, when you get a little older, I'm, I'm going to be 78 in a week or two. Wow. And, <laughs> and you start to, to treasure things and notice what you really, really care about in life. And uh, today was meeting with you and talking with you. It, it, it was really a wonderful experience for me. And I thank you. Yeah, thank you. I, 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 my pleasure to meet my like role model for all these years. I was like, uh, to be honest, I was so excited last night. I did not sleep well because I was thinking, oh, wow. oh my gosh, I, I like know you from your books for all these years. Finally, I got to meet you. I even yeah. think I need to do a, you know, screenshot to make sure like yeah. I have this, this um, screen to be with you side to side. Sure. And, to like, you know, it happened. <laughs> Beautiful, thank you. Well, if your audience likes it and you know, maybe at some point we can do another show on some slightly different but related topic because I, I just love doing this kind of thing. Great, I would definitely love that. I'm sure people are liking it. Oh, we did not get a chance for you to talk about the lawyer's story, but I think you covered Oh it. yeah, Great. we forgot. Yeah, let's, let's, let, we'll do that on another yeah. show. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. That, I forgot that story. That's another fantastic story about right. the man who had struggled with anxiety hmm. uh, and he had had 31 years of failed 
five day a week psychoanalysis when he came to me wow. because of his anxiety and yeah. uh, feeling like he wasn't good enough. So we'll do that one next time. <laughs>